Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the first Tuesday of the month, which means it's time for Straight Talk with Dr. Doug Lyle, where he is answering your questions that you have sent in to us in advance. Please welcome him back. Hi, Dr. Lyle. How are hey, you? How are you doing, AJ? Why do you think you're such a popular guest? Uh, I I have no idea since I don't really know that I'm popular, but that's fine. All All I right, know I'll, maybe because uh, you wear really cool hats when I'm on. Yes. That's a really <laughs> cool hat. I'll rephrase the questions. You get more questions than pretty much any other guest followed closely by the the, the, the dermatologist. Is it because everybody ah. has skin and everybody has a mind? <laughs> good, good. Why not? Okay. Well, I, I I swear you're going to think I made up this first question. The 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 person's name is Charles, which is my husband's name, but it's so funny. I could have asked it. And it is, Dr. Lyle, how can I ask for alone time from my girlfriend I'm living with? I'll note that I'm quite introverted. How can I ask for alone time? Mm-hmm. Boy, from the, and he's living with her? That's what he said. That's a very short question. Boy, um, I would I, I would just frame it this way that if you're living with your girlfriend, then you're then she pro- pretty you know thinks pretty highly of you to to be all the way to to living with you. So in that case, I think that you can take the risk to simply say, hey, could we? Uh, probably a good idea would be to. Uh, I mean, I'm just trying to read through the anxiety here that this person has. Um, I would say that I would probably uh, look for a sort of a, a, a once weekly recurrent theme on something like this. Like, hey, could we do it that that uh, every Sunday evening it's just us? You know, what I mean, something like that. Uh, in other words, or or just one night a week, maybe Thursday nights is just us and we just go out, we're, et cetera, something or Saturday morning. In other words, uh, I would pitch it not so that we don't have to be constantly asking for it, but we ask, we we say, hey, could we try something? Could we have it like on, uh, you know, sometime either Saturday, depending upon what you, you have going in your life, either Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon, yeah, it's just we just hang together and we don't do anything else with other people, something like that. And I, I would pitch that uh, in sort of that fashion and see what happens. If she says, God, no, there's no freaking way I want to hang out with you by yourself. Then, you know, you're in the wrong place. What if he joins a bowling league and then doesn't go bowling? But it's a, but it's a league. He does. He doesn't want. Oh, that's uh, right. But he, yeah, I was thinking he could tell her he's joining this bowling league and then just go sit somewhere by himself. I don't you know. know. He wants, oh, I thought he wanted alone time with her. Oh, the way I interpreted it is he wants, okay, this is interesting. This is why sometimes it's worth it to take live questions from the chat. I oh. interpreted the question that he wanted time to himself, but you could oh, be right. You could be right too. And uh, in, it, it, in, in that case, if it's something that's going on with him, then that it's uh, a little bit, it's a little bit simpler for us to see our way towards what it is that would suffice him because it would be sort of an introspective problem for us to figure out what is it that he needs? Does he need an hour a day by himself or does he sometimes need a whole day to himself? You know what I mean? So we, we'd have to first determine that. And then the uh, if that's what the issue is, then, then you just, I mean, the, the girlfriend is not going to be threatened by this, knowing that this guy... He's not using this time by himself to to go out and hit on other girls. I mean, she she can read introvert all over his forehead. So, and it's unlikely that this is likely to be bothersome to her. Um, so if she's if she's not introverted, she's got plenty of people to talk to and and all all kinds of uh, friends to to be corresponding with. So at that point, you just say, hey, you know, what I want to do is. Like half a day every weekend, I just want to just just map that out for myself. Just all I just don't want to I don't want to talk to anybody. I want to shut my phone off and and et cetera. In other words, and so I want to just do my own number. 
So that that is how I would do it. But yeah, I'm not sure what the exact question is. It's an interesting. It's the second one. Your interpretation is actually easier because you know it's uh it's anyway. We'll find out, but but yeah, I, I would say the 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 most important solution to the problem is to not be negotiating this constantly, but in fact negotiate a an experimental pitch for a structural change in how it is that you're living. Uh, and so every Saturday morning, this or et cetera, that sort of thing. That's how I would do that. So Charles, if we didn't hit the nail on the head, write us back. Isn't it interesting how introverts and extroverts often hook up? Not to say that his girlfriend is extroverted. We don't know, but it seems like a lot of couples, I know there's one of each. Yeah, they are not. Okay. So what there really are is that there are they, they may be on e on either side of the bell curve, but it's going to turn out that 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 is just um, people are typically selecting for people that are fairly similar to them on those dimensions. So uh, when you get anybody that where there's a couple of people that are quite, quite different, that happens to be an unusual case. Uh, there, there's pretty strong. Um, personality selection bias against that happening. Uh, but people can certainly notice that difference because even at small differences, a 60th percentile extrovert versus a 30th percentile, that difference, even though it's completely within the normal noise of, of human differences, that difference enough can be enough to cause friction. So that's, but that, and that's probably what you're noticing, AJ, and that's what people comment about. So they aren't, Oh, gee, my husband's such an introvert. No, he's not. He's at the 30th percentile uh, and you're at the 60th percentile. And that difference causes a fair amount of friction, even at that level. That's yeah. a good, that's good in, comment. Because, yeah. Interesting, because I'm way more introverted than people give me credit for because I have a persona. But right. really, when I go to conferences, I like staying in my room. Sure. Yeah. Got interesting. It. Yeah, well. Yeah, I would say that you're not, neither an introvert nor extrovert. You're in the middle of the bell curve. Yeah. The um, it it and a lot of people that are in the middle of the bell curve. That, I mean, a lot of performers can be somewhere on the dimension, but they're absolutely not extroverts. They're not in the top top fifth. And so, uh, and so as a result, when they if they're performing and they're uh, interacting with a lot of people. Boy, by the time they've done that, that's more than enough for a while. Now they need now they need it quiet. I think that's kind of what you experience. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. This question is from Susan, and she says, thanks to listening to Beat Your Genes, I've been off my ADHD medication for almost a year. I read articles everywhere that people with ADHD need more stimulation to feel the ordinary pleasure that most people feel to access dopamine. I feel like I'm the same person I was before taking the medication for 15 years, only now I'm more tired. I've taken a drink and one cup of coffee a day to get going. Is this okay? I'm whole food plant-based, sofas free. My CB tells me it's worth the feeling the coffee gives me me yeah that's interesting it's generally a trap so uh i think that it's a trap that's super easy to walk into in other words what's what where you probably are now is that if you've had coffee a cup of coffee every day for a month by this time your brain's habituated to it and so as a result of that you're actually no better off now your functioning is no better off than it was five weeks ago when you weren't drinking any coffee but the, the problem is now, if you don't drink the coffee, you're going to go into withdrawal and you're going to feel the fatigue. And uh, as a result of that, you're going to go through that process and you don't want to go through that process. You can tell that it feels worse by not having it. So now what we've got is we've got a low grade addictive cycle going on. So the, of course, low grade addictive cycles, even high grade addictive cycles, but certainly low grade ones are almost imperceptible in terms of analyzing their cost. You're not aware of the cost. It just feels like, no, it's all benefit. Uh, but what you're not seeing is the, essentially the subtle sleep disruption, the lack of uh, as, as high quality sleep as you would have had. And if you don't drink the coffee, you'll definitely feel the fatigue as a result of going through the withdrawal process. So now you feel like, no, if I really established the evidence, the evidence is, that I'm better off with the coffee than without the coffee. It's like, no, no, you're not. Okay. You are, 
you're better off without the coffee, but you have to pay the price to get all the way through the withdrawal process and then get yourself fully and appropriately rested. And then you will be the best off that you can be. So you're, uh, anyway, that, that's, that's the truth of the story. Uh, but, but that truth, you know, it's not a crime for somebody to be a coffee drinker. It's not like some, some terrible health penalty that you are, you know, putting on yourself, but you are not improving your existence, uh, with respect to how it is that you would feel physically. That is a mirage based on the fact that you are essentially, uh, you're in a little, you're in a little addictive trap, little midget little midget pleasure trap and that's uh and it's got you fooled so that's actually what's taking place is her statement yep. that the people with adhd need more stimulation to feel the ordinary pleasure no it's just a, this is all this is all uh, fairy tales from from you know all kinds of uh directions uh they are they are people with adhd or a heterogeneous group of people with all kinds of different characteristics um, and so, you know, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be making a, uh, number one, I wouldn't be making a, a blanket statement about them. Second of all, the, there is no disorder. So I'm immediately reactive to the notion that there's anything called attention deficit disorder, or attention deficit hyperactivity, uh, hyperactivity disorder. These are, um, to the best of our knowledge, um, hmm. It's possible that these people, uh, that some of this is secondary to brain damage due to pesticides and, you know, other, other, other kinds of things that could uh, have taken place. But I'm not so sure that that's true. Uh, there, there, is, there is legitimate research to be done on that if anybody could ever do it. But it's pretty tricky to ever do that research and ever get it published. Pretty hard to establish. The effect sizes are probably pretty small. Um, I rate that as an unknown at this point. However, the, the concept that it's a disorder is mm, not, not well defended. In other words, the, the better, better hypothesis is that it's not a disorder at all. All this is is individual random variation in personality. Uh, and we, we can, uh, myself and others have, uh, I'm sure I read it somewhere. I think I read it in David Buss or in some some deep evolutionary thinker says, hey, notice that it's 90% of them are young boys, okay? So if this was damage done by pesticide residue, et cetera, it should affect males and females equally. So the fact that this is diagnostic, uh, almost almost exclusively diagnosed in boys, not, not totally exclusively, but almost exclusively, then that tells us that it's much more likely to be nothing other than an inherent underlying difference in male and female psychology. And that uh, we start to get down to the, uh, the fact that it's particularly prominent in a boy that's, you know, eight to 12, 14 years old. And that, that is going to be, make sense in an evolutionary process where that boy is not going to be hanging out with the girls close to mom. Uh, instead, he's going to be 50 or 100 yards down the river. He's not going to be allowed to go on hunting with the men. And therefore, he's in more dangerous circumstances than, than, uh, than his sister. And as a result, he needs to have a more rapidly shifting attention uh, when it comes to environmental stimuli. He needs to move his head if he sees something moving a little bit, where she does not have to be as concerned because she's around 15 other women and 15 other girls, and they're all picking berries or digging for potatoes, all within 30 yards of each other. So they've got 30 pairs of eyes looking out and listening for trouble where he doesn't. And so that, that means that he should shift his attention more quickly uh, and should be less able to uh, keep his eyes on somebody's face focusing the way the females are, are uh, at close quarters talking about this, that, and the other. He's out there by himself spearfishing, uh, practicing, practicing his hunting skills. He needs to actually be far more highly distractible in order to save his hide. So as a result, that that is a uh, uh, an excellent, likely explanation for ADHD and therefore 
there's nothing about that that has anything to do with needing more dopamine signaling for anything. This is a simply a characteristic as probably a simply a, a different looking bell curve with respect to attentional focus that sits inside of the male brain, probably pr pronounced and more obvious when they are eight to 12. Notice that many people that were diagnosed with ADHD at 12 years old and were difficult to settle down in the classroom, which is a totally unnatural situation, um, may be more rapidly shifting attentional when they're 25, but they aren't, they don't even remotely look disordered. They're, they're just a little, they're just slightly more uh, animated and slightly more distracted as people walk by but they are not, there's nothing about this that is any way inhibiting them. So that's going to be your most classic process. So the thing that looks disturbing actually mostly looks disturbing to teachers who want to see their the kid not rattling its head head and, and attention all over the classroom, talking to other people, poking at things, et cetera. They, uh, i.e. little boys like that were not designed to be sitting in classrooms, period. OK, so it isn't it isn't the little boy who has a problem. It's the, the classroom. We're putting them in a natural environment. And then we have a, a behavioral characteristic that uh, at the ends of the bell curve is inconvenient. Okay, so that's, I think, what all that is. Thank you. Here's an right. interesting question from Esther about worry. What is the possibility of worry impacting one's ability to heal when they're already eating a plant-based diet? If people worry prior to finding a solution that they can trust, how do they move forward into a peaceful place? What role does worry play in our cost-benefit analysis in making decisions? Um, talk about a lot of different things. We, we can substitute worry for anxiety. Uh, so we can we can be sort of a little bit clearer about this. Uh, worry doesn't get in the way of any healing at all. It doesn't matter how much you worry, it's not going to impact your healing one way or the other. The, so that's out. So uh, all worry is is you're, you're you're describing you're describing two sort of different aspects of the same phenomenon. Uh, you're describing the mental characteristics about what the person is doing. Which is that they're they're running um, they're running imaginary scenarios of bad things that could happen, i.e., they are worried that this could happen or that could happen, and they are therefore trying to analyze the risks that they're facing about whatever the thing is, and they're therefore trying to solve uh, that problem or mitigate those risks. So if you're you know, you're worried about your taxes, you're worried about the fact that your car tires need to be changed, and you're hoping that. You don't have a flat tire before you can afford to or get into the shop and have new tires put on. Uh, if you look at your life, your life is one great big worry up to the next as you're constantly analyzing that something, you know, oh, my gosh, we have to I have to get in the car because I'm worried that I'm going to be late to the dentist. OK, so if you look and see uh, what's actually going on inside of a human nervous system, it spends quite a bit of time switching into a semi-anxious or acutely anxious state as it, quote, worries about some possible negative outcome that could take place. Now, that process, all you, that you're looking at there is you're looking at the calculations that the adapted mind is doing about uh, risk analysis. And so uh, that, that, that's all that's taking place. And the, uh, the organism is oriented to uh, it, it's built in order to have feelings associated with significant, uh, you know, uh, significant risks or opportunities. So the other side of worry is excitement. That's it's just a mirror image of it. So excitement is, hey, I think something really, really cool is going to happen. I'm excited about it. Worry is, oh, shit, I'm really worried that something bad's going to happen. It's just simply the mirror image. You can actually watch this as you are getting in the car, racing to the dentist, you know what I mean? And you're worried that you're going to be late and embarrassed and they're going to kind of give you some negative feedback. And then, then what happens is, is that you're kind of, you turn the corner and just as you're pulling up to a light, it turns green. And now what happens? You're a little bit excited. Like, Hey, it looks like I got, I made a light. Okay. And then you see two or three lights down the road 
right down Main Street, they're all turning green. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be able to slither in there. If you we watched inside your nervous system, we'd be finding an excitement where previously there was worry. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, so that's all worry is is just a it, it's the anxiety along with the calculating system that is that is uh, calculating the possibility of loss, and that possibility the possibility of loss uh, results in anxiety into varying de degrees very small degrees with something that hardly bothers you at all. Um, you know, something like, oh, I, I get I get slightly worried when I'm about to open up my uh, electric bill in the summer because it's like, oh, I know I've been using the air conditioning a lot. So I'm worried about how big it's going to be. So if it's if it's uh, out here in Sacramento, it's pretty high. So if it's under $300 when I open it up, I'm happy. If it's over $300, I open it up, I feel slightly guilty and self-indulgent. <laughs> so there's a little bit of quote worry inside of that nervous system when I open up that letter. Okay, is what that is. So worry is not an impediment to any healing process. Um, I suppose you you could be so anxious that you would disrupt your sleep, and that that in theory that that could uh, be reducing a healing process, but not really, because the the truth is is that the system is inherently self regulated. Uh, to the point where it's not going to do you any damage by essentially adrenalizing the system a bit to keep you awake in order to have you continue to run calculations. Uh, if it wants you awake to continue to run calculations, there must be a pretty big loss that you are attempting to mitigate your way around. And the brain is saying, we need to keep working on this problem. We, got, we don't need an extra hour of sleep. We need an extra hour of thinking. And the truth is, is that you might say, no, I want to go to sleep. It's like, well, too bad. We're not going to let you go to sleep. We are having you piece together the pot, everything that we know. We're going over it again and again and again. We're running through all the types, types of alternative scenarios. We are searching for a way around this loss that we are, quote, worried about. Okay? It's perfectly fine uh, for the nervous system to do that. And trust me, uh, you will go to sleep and you will sleep more tomorrow if you need to. Uh, in order to reach an appropriate equilibrium for that system. So anyway, that that's the story. I forget what else uh, the person oh, asked. Uh, okay. Um, she well, well for, before you go on, I just want to say so. You know, you hear hear that saying, "You're going to worry yourself sick. You're going to worry yourself to death." So chronic worry doesn't have any impact at all on none. No, that that's just a if people have a very strong myth. AJ, and that's the notion that very unpleasant emotions are somehow damaging for you. Okay. So I, I knew a psychologist who, you know, uh, her, that her oncologist told her that, you know, when you had that problem with your boyfriend three or four years ago, that may be when you got your breast cancer. I, I couldn't believe it. The, the, the woman that I was talking to was a professor at a major medical university. And the oncologist she talked to was a professor at a major medical, at that same medical me, major university. I, it was unbelievable that I'm listening to this. It's like two fools talking to each other about something that is impossible. There's, there's no possible way that that's how that works. But people believe that because if you, when you are, when you, uh, when you actually have physical pain, physical pain does do you damage. I mean, it's, it's not the physical pain doesn't do you damage, but it's evidence of damage. So when you tear the ligaments in your knee, it's excruciatingly painful. And that pain is the insignia that damage has taken place. It's part of the system to orient you that damage is taking place and that you need to take uh, basically risk mitigating action by not putting your weight on it. That's how that works. When you, you know, when you bite your lip and you can feel the pain as you're chewing something and you're biting your lip, you're like, whoa, you have an instantaneous reflex to stop that biting because you're doing tissue damage. Okay, so pain is a is an absolutely essential uh, characteristic for animals uh, of their design so that it, that it mitigates damage by alerting you to the fact that there is a threat uh, to the structure of the organism. Now, it turns out that that similarly, anxiety and depression, et cetera, they, these two classic uh, characteristics of uh, uh, negative emotional states for humans, 
those can we it actually sort of feels painful it's not actually pain it's not physical pain but it's unpleasant as hell and as a result it can people then naturally have sort of thought well wait a second isn't that damaging so they feel like oh my god i went through you know such a tough time you know in high school where i was being rejected or my parents went through divorce and and you know they can remember how ang anxiety provoking these things were uh and then they feel like that anxiety because it was unpleasant somehow 10 years later it's responsible for some problem that they have in their life okay uh in other words the, physically the answer is no of course not that's nothing to do with it the emotional responses are not damaging to the organism at all any more so than pain is damaging to the organism. Pain is not damaging to the organism. It's the underlying tissue damage that is resulting in the pain that it does damage to the organism. So, uh, the, the uh, but you can see why people think so. So the uh, worry, you're gonna worry yourself to death. No, you're not. You can, sorry about that. It's not gonna reduce the length of your life at all. Worry, 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 worry. Worry away and, Get your fill of it, okay? That's just a brain that is attempting to do what? What could get you is the thing that you're worried about. Like, for example, I'm worried like crazy that those the crack house next door, sooner or later, there's going to be a bullet that's going to fly through here and kill me, okay? Right. So the worry isn't going to do you any damage, but the bullet may kill you that's coming in from the crack house. That absolutely could kill you. So that's why you're worried. The worries are not damaging. So that's a deep confusion in human beings about the, the unpleasant feelings are damaging. Unpleasant feelings are not damaging. If they were damaging, they would have been selected out by evolution. Uh, that, 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 you know, that, that would, it would have been disadvantageous to have feelings that caused damage. And therefore, organisms do not have feelings that cause damage. That is not part of the neural design of animal life. Well, that's interesting. Even in GI stuff, worry doesn't make a difference? Uh, GI, it's not doing any damage at all. What it's doing is when you're worried, it can disrupt GI function for the specific reason that, um, that you have a natural uh, predator defense process that when you are very anxious about something and you're kicking out adrenaline, you want to vacate the bowels in order to be able to run faster, okay? So that's what that is. So GI, uh, people with irritable bowel syndrome, you will find the irritable bowel acting up, in other words, becoming more active and trying to vacate, but that's not doing you any damage. That The irritable bowel process of going through a irritable bowel spasm isn't doing you any damage. You have an underlying um, inflammatory condition that is doing the damage. The damage has already been done by whatever it is that did that caused the underlying irritable bowel process or the active dietary choices that are resulting in the irritable bowel. But the but the irritable bowel episode isn't doing any damage at all. That's uh so that so I I would I would stand on that argument that no, it's not doing any damage. You're you're just going through a painful process, uh, a, a temporary painful process as a result of adrenaline trying to save your life because it 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 is thinking that you are in a predator-prey crisis. And that's it's not biologically expensive to go through a predator-prey crisis. It's just disruptive. When you eat a meal, it's disruptive. All kinds of things have to take place when you eat a meal. You go through a big digestive process, stuff gets released from, you know, bile acids, you know, stomach acids are churning, the, 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 there's all kinds of, in other words, this is a very disruptive process. It's not damaging to eat. It's, it's, it's a disequilibrium process. The same thing is happening when someone is very anxious. Panic attack doesn't do anybody any damage. The, uh, it's just unpleasant. Uh, she mentioned um, what role does worry place in our play in our cost benefit analysis of making decisions? Oh, well, the worry is the cost benefit analysis. 
Okay. Oh. So in other words, the, what the worry is, the worry is the process of the organism considering the, the risk that it's exposed to and attempting to mitigate that risk. So that's, that's what that process is. So, so if you're trying to ask what, what, what role does it play, um, the worry, I think the best part, the best way to describe the worry is again, replace it with anxiety. What role does anxiety play in this? The, the role that it plays is orienting the organism to the magnitude of how the unconscious mind is assessing the risk, the risk, the, the threat that you have. So the anxiety is going to be greater, to, uh, it's going to be more intense and orienting the organism more completely on whatever it is that it thinks the threat is. Okay, so if suddenly you're sipping tea on your back porch and then suddenly a black widow, you know what I mean, comes down and then lands on your on your hand and you look over and you see a black widow, you're going to be extremely anxious. Okay, uh, just human beings by nature are terrified of black widows, uh, what they look like. Just the structure of a black widow goes right to your soul uh, and says that is serious trouble. Another spider won't do that. A spider looks different. A tarantula will. Oh, a wolf there, spider there. will too, if you ask me. Yeah. Yeah, there are there are specific structures of spiders that your adapted mind is designed by nature to alert the organism at different levels of anxiety. Okay, and that is uh, that's true with all threats. Uh, the, the 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 purpose of the mind is to alert you to threats and opportunities, and it does so by running calculations and then generating emotion, and that's how it works. And, and worry is genetic, so right? yeah, it, it is a a big genetic component to, in other words, if you are, there are, everybody has different kinds of risks that they are more or less concerned about. So I'm not a germ phobic. I'm not particularly worried about it, but one of my best friends is. So his, he spends a lot of the workspace inside of his head is constantly working on mitigating risk of, of, uh, of toxic exposure. It's just, that's how it works. That's that's how his brain works. So he he has experienced far more anxiety in his life than I have. He has no anxiety and never did about approaching girls. <laughs> None. <laughs> in fact, he got me a couple of the best dates I ever had because he just walked up to he walked up to some gal in an elevator in San Francisco and said, "Hey, who are you? Hey, I got a friend of mine you should meet." He is totally shameless. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's interesting. Thank I you. I got plenty of anxiety about that. I got at least my natural share of anxiety about that process. That's Just so interesting. Different brains. Yep. So this question is interesting because I was actually discussing it with a bunch of people when I was eating at the plantrician conference with them. Um, and it is from Aminta. And she says, Dr. Lyle, I don't know how to share anymore, especially food. I get stingy. I get weird about it. Like I can't let go or I want it for myself or I'm going to run out. I really want to share wholeheartedly and cheerfully. I used to be able to do this. Then I got exposed to a roommate who put labels of their name on everything. So I followed along and did the same, but now I can't turn it off. Help change my attitude back, please. I love your show. I learned so much from you and thank you for the sound advice. Isn't that a funny question? Bar. That That is a very odd report. So, because if anything ever sounded like a personality characteristic, that would be it. So it, it would seem I would have to ask that person what you know what is their best best understanding of the the mental process that they're going through that causes them to feel like there is some kind of a deficiency or shortage that they have that they're feeling threatened. Okay. So that's if we go back through this, we understand that her feelings are not just random uh, and they're not trained. They are the result of a cost-benefit analysis that's taking place. So something about this is that she is, uh, it's possible that she's inferring as a result of living with a roommate who is, you know, anxious, uh, nut about this and 
uh, extremely defensive and paranoid that she now has got the idea that that's how everybody is. And therefore you got to better look out or they're going to steal your donut. You know what I mean? In other words, it's like, Oh, I didn't know everybody in this town was a pickpocket for God's sakes. <laughs> so now suddenly now, now I'm on the red alert. So uh, if you spent some time in some little city, you know, somewhere in a foreign country where there's pickpockets everywhere and you got your pocket picked uh, and then they told you, Oh my God. Yeah. That's a, it, it's, a, it's the, it's our, it's the sport of our town. How good are you at a pickpocket? You didn't know this. And so you like, and then you started watching it and you saw, started to see that people were getting their pockets picked. Then when you came home to Laguna beach, you know, there would still be some residual little thing in there. Like, Hey, people can pick pockets and, you know, maybe they're still going to try to pick my pocket. Maybe that's sort of in there. So I, uh, I, but it should go through a decay function. So the, the brain does not be, uh, it's not traumatized by some event where it learns something and then it doesn't forget it. Uh, that would be, uh, that, that's the mistake of everybody that thinks uh, that trauma is a major impact on human life. It is not. So uh, it, it, isn't, it isn't because the, that kind of thinking is naive, basically sensing that the organism does not continue to learn. In other words, it, it continued to learn all through the moment where it had this big traumatic event. So it got beat up by the, the schoolyard bully. And then it stops learning for the rest of its life, apparently. In other words, it learns, 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 learns. And it learns about the school bully. And it learns what happens when the school bully comes after you. But that's the moment and the time of its life where it ceases to learn for the rest of its life. That is absurd. Of course it learns. It continues to learn the next day, just like it learned the day before. And it learns two days later and two years later and 20 years later and 40 years later, all the way to its dying day, it's learning. Okay. So it never ceases to learn, which means that the risk analysis that somebody does over something like this is constantly being updated. It's being updated with data every day, every hour. So that's why, you know, th there, there were some kids on the schoolyard that were Kind of a little bit scary when I was in junior high school. I, do I think about them now? No, that never even occurred to me now. Okay, so if I think back on it, can I remember him? Yeah, I suppose I can. I remember there's a kid named James Ezell. Okay, and he, for some reason, he had he was a, a, a tough little guy, and for some reason, he had some little chip on his shoulder with respect to me. I haven't thought about this in 40 years, uh, 50 years, for God's sakes. And um, and so kids used to walk behind other kids and then sweep their legs and cause you to trip. That was a, uh, it didn't happen often, but sort of the badass kids would do that once in a while to people. And James Ezell did that to me a couple of times. And when I turned around, he was just smiling, you know, little, little sociopathic smile. So I was I was a little worried about James Zell because I thought, you know, he had some bad news friends. And um and but I never wanted to get into it with him. And um in gym class I could see that he wasn't that strong, but he sure had a tough look, you know, I mean it's a very tough look. And then I somehow got inside of a teacher's uh I could read the teacher's little uh, uh, little score sheets of, uh, of uh, scores. And I don't know what teacher it was, but I somehow got up there and I had some class with that kid. I think it might have been gym class or something. Maybe I might have been teacher's pet. And I was putting in the little scores for pull-ups. I don't know what it was. But I saw that James Ezell had a, was a second percentile reader. It's like, oh. This kid's borderline retarded. I mean, I didn't know those words, but I knew, oh God, he's not, he doesn't have any brains at all. And so, yeah, there, there's a, a, a little, two things happen. Number one, a little fear that this guy doesn't have smart enough to know when he could do you really damage because he's, you know, i.e. people that are very low brains can do big damage and not even know they're doing it. And then don't really have particular remorse because they can't think through the consequences of their actions. And the second part is a little bit of relief knowing he can't scheme for anything. You know, so so what I'm seeing is some goofy little thing. 
So I was always a little bit anxious, you know, and I kept my eye out in those junior high school hallways for James Ezell. Um, that James, uh, I don't have to worry about using his ter term now. But we know he's not listening to this podcast. He can't read anything. He's not. You know, <laughs> God knows whatever happened to James Ezell. But sometime in the next couple of years, James Ezell disappeared. And then I heard that he was expelled, which is super rare. Okay, so uh, not he was suspended. He was expelled from school. He would never be coming back to that school. So James Ezell lasted till about the middle of the eighth grade in conventional education, at which point he got sent off to the bye-bye land for kids just like him, never to return. Never saw him in, in a high school uh, where we would have gone to school, et cetera. Now, God knows what that whole story was about, i.e. trauma, i.e. things that have happened to us and whether or not we would be updated. Did I ever think about James Ezell after that? No. Okay, it's like, oh, well, I hadn't seen him for a while. Now I find out that he's officially gone. Now I'm really not worried about it. Nervous system updates to the situation. Does it ever completely be erased out of memory? Nope, we just found out it isn't erased out of memory. Half a century later, that's in my head, coded under traumatic processes because I was worried about what? Threats. And I had some anxiety walking those those hallways, looking, have, keeping my eye out for James Ezell because he made a few little moves that somehow indicated that he was after me. I don't know that he was. I think he might have liked me, for God's sakes. <laughs> there was never a cross word between James Ezell and I. Uh, but anyway, I have no idea. But the point is, was I a little bit traumatized? Yeah, because nobody else tried to trip me from behind. It's the only kid that ever did that. So anyway, so this person, in terms of their funny little characteristics of being defensive about the food, I'm amazed at this. When did you get rid of the roommate? Okay. How many times have you actually had this characteristic that's taking place? In other words, this is, you may have noticed a little residual, plot, you know, contagion of paranoia about other people after your food. Uh, uh, that that came as a result of some of this process. But I can't imagine that this isn't going through a natural decay function, particularly with whole natural food. Who the hell wants your whole natural food? Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, what can I tell you? Your whatever funny little characteristic this is, whatever life it has, it should be undergoing a decay function. And, um, and because your nervous system should be updating the suspicion that may have been implanted by your strange roommate and the fact that other people are not particularly after your food and that that mind will update and you'll return to normal. Well, what I thought interesting about the question is I'm a very giving person. I'll make food for you, but I personally don't like when people take food from my plate. And 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 so it, you can ask Shada, like she once took a fry, a sweet potato fry from my plate and I slapped her. So I will give you food, but I will personally not share food. And it drives me crazy. Like why do people have to have a sip of what I'm drinking or a taste? I would never ask you, Dr. Lyle, for a sip or a taste. So that's probably why I resonated a little bit with that question, but yes. that's also a nutcase. Yeah, well, and also there, it it starts to it starts to bleed into some other issues, uh, things like that, like uh, um, like for example, the the germ phobia. Like, hey, I don't want your hands anywhere near my plate, and no, I don't want you taking a sip out of my thing. I don't you, even if you do it on the side, you know what I mean. That uh, hence my famous Doctor Oz moment. You know, you remember that story? I remember you telling that story. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> that I didn't funny. want to touch his food. I, I got under him like a little gosling and wanted him to shell. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, there you go. That's funny. Okay. So are you familiar with the new Netflix series called Living to 100? No. Okay. Well, it's Dan Butner and it's about the blue zones. And Gene said, I would like Dr. Lyle to explain his feelings about the blue zone studies. He mentioned them briefly in one episode and seemed kind of dismissive. So I was curious to have him talk about it more. Yeah, I'm totally dismissive of the blue zones. So uh, the truth of the matter is, is that the, uh, uh, th there's nothing magical happening in any, you know, one, one of the things that you'll find is that a way to sell things 
uh, particularly in the health, health and wellness arena, is to infect them with psychology. That is a very big selling point. So Dean Ornish smelled that there was pay dirt in that. And so in his original studies on reverse of heart disease, he made sure he called it open your heart, the open your heart program. And we're going to meditate and we're going to get the men together and talk about their feelings and all this kind of stuff. Okay. This is all bogus and completely worthless. It has nothing to do with opening cardiovascular pathways at all. Okay. But if you infuse that into a system, then it's sexier, makes you look like a nice guy. You know, you're holistic because you're looking at all the angles. And therefore, it seems like, you know, great ancient traditional wisdom is involved. This is just ridiculous. And Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn came along and said, you know what? I'm going to do the same study, except I'm going to do it a little different than Dean. Yeah, respectful. But we're going to make sure that in what I do, we don't do any of that California mumbo jumbo. There is going to be no discussions about opening your heart. There's going to be no processing of our feelings. What we're going to do is we're going to get more ruthless than Dean is about the diet and basically teaching people how it is to, you know, to prepare their food, plan more carefully. I'm going to get my wife here. We're going to sit right down with them in my house and chop the stuff and make sure they understand it. And basically don't come to my program unless you're bringing the wife with you. That's how Esselstyn did it, okay? Guess what? Better results than Ornish. No touchy-feely anything. So touchy-feely, people would love to hear good news about their bad habits. You know, it's more important to enjoy the day than to eat healthy. You know, because why? Because it feels good. And you had a great laugh. And that's how you got rid of your cancers, that you laughed and enjoyed yourself with your friends. Not true. None of it's true. Okay. So Blue Zones ha is infused with the concept that community and all this kind of stuff. Hey, listen, that has nothing to do with it. It's very simple. Body's a mechanical operating system. If you violate what its capacities are in any direction, it's going to have structural compromise. That's how this thing works. Once again, we go back to the myth that sits deep inside of human psychology, that bad feelings cause damage and good feelings are healing. Bad feelings do not cause damage and good feelings are not healing. Those are nothing other than uh, emotions that are signaling losses or opportunities with respect to other kinds of resources with respect to your survival and reproductive success. But it has absolutely nothing to do with the signals themselves as being either damaging or helpful. All right, so that's how that works. And so blue zones, to the extent that it, you know, there's something magical about the community processes, et cetera, forget about it. It's just about food. It's about food and whether people smoke cigarettes or not, and whether or not they get exercise. So that's it. That's the story. And there's more to it than that that I don't want to share here. That uh, he does. He did. There, there is a major source of, of data that he is uh, consciously and deliberately ignoring uh, because you, you, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not sure. Well, I do know why, and I'm not, I'm not going to actually say it here because I don't want to be, I don't want to be hyper controversial. But the truth is, is that that a substantial portion of the variance in how long people live uh, has, has to do with things that have absolutely nothing to do with their community, with where they're located on the planet or anything else. So bottom line is, is that all, all we need to know is that living to 100 is something that will happen to about 1% of people. Okay, that's how that works. Okay, so this is a, uh, if you look at the deterioration of the human body, the deterioration of the human body goes through extraordinarily regular and predictable dysfunction curves. You cannot stop them, okay? And so the, the question is, can you reduce the amount of damage that is being done by toxicity that is possibly, uh, uh, that could be avoided? Yes. Yes, you can. You can reduce excessive damage to the organism. You cannot reduce or slow down the natural damaging process. That is impossible at this point in, in 
in the, the human scientific investigation of this process. There is no way to do this. Okay. So you are you are going to die, and sooner or later you will die as a result of the natural deteriorating background uh, decomposition of of the of the thing that is you, and somewhere in there one or more organ systems will be compromised to the extent that they can no longer perform their biological function as a result of structural changes that could be observed at the microbiological level, and now you're dead. And that's it, all there is to it. So the question is, when does that take place? And the answer is, well, it's going to take place a hell of a lot faster if you do things that damage the organism in any way. You get too much sun exposure. Oops, that's going to be a problem. You get too little like sun exposure. Oops, that's going to be a problem. You get too much exercise. Mm, that could be a problem. Okay. You get too little exercise. So that's going to be a problem. You get too much. You can't get too much sleep. You can get too little sleep, though. Okay. So there are, and certainly by far the biggest variant, the two biggest variants by far are going to be toxic uh, intake, you know, into the lungs from either coal in West Virginia coal mine, you know, 50 years ago or by cigarette smoking, easily the biggest single damaging you know, uh, thing in, in human life in, in the last hundred years, or diet, which is now a close second. Okay, so cigarettes do more to reduce life expectancy than diet does, okay? So, but those of us that don't smoke, we've X'd out off of the list. The, so then what's left? Diet, okay? And the, the dietary variances, carry about a 5% uh, reduction of, of likelihood of life expectancy uh, per organism. Use are sitting, every individual, uh, the, the day they are born or the day they are conceived, actually, has within them a, um, a maximum life expectancy if they were under idealized conditions. It looks like for men, most men in the world, that's probably about 85, and most women, it's probably about 89. So the uh, there's going to be what's known as a standard deviation uh, of a few years on either side of that. So there will be, if you are a genetically 99th percentile male and you do not blow it by cigarette smoking or poor diet, then you got, you got about a 1% chance of getting to 100 it turns out that the natural deterioration process is if you get to 100, then only you have a 50-50 chance of getting to 101. If you get to 101, you've got a 50-50 chance of getting to 102. If you get to 102, you've got a 50-50 chance of getting to 103. So if you get to 100, you've only got a 1 out of 8 chance of getting to 103. You've got a 1 in 16 chance of getting to 104. In other words, you have reached the genetic limits of the organism and you have to be an unbelievable freak to get to 105. Okay? You have to be a total statistical anomaly. So the notion of some show about living to 100 or the blue zones or anything that talks this way is taking our focus away from the truth. Okay, It's not the community and the joy and the stomping on the grapes in, 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 the, in the rural Italy. This is, and singing and dancing and enjoying each other's company and a sense of community. It's got nothing to do with it. This has to do with the toxicity of the organism and whether or not you are unnecessarily accelerating its dysfunction, okay? So you could, you know, that's what it's about. And so therefore the only blue zone that matters is the blue zone in your kitchen. Nothing else is going to make any difference. Well, first of all, you, you're not afraid to go against what is popular. Not at all. Kind of like Dr. McDougall. You've got that. Oh, yeah, that's my buddy. <laughs> because because the people that you're talking about are friends and I have them on the show and I don't like to I, argue with anybody because that's not what I am. I because, understand. Yeah. I understand, this, but they cannot support their position you know, listen, Blue Zones is a good thing that it brought people the knowledge that, hey, you don't have to have all the dysfunction that you see in Birmingham, Alabama, okay? It, let, let's go study some places where people are healthier. Let's see what we can learn. 
And when they do, if they're careful about that, they learn that the diets are quite a bit different than they are in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, so, but then what happens is, a la Dean Ornish, now we start to have mission creep about what the mes message is, and we it starts to get holistic and impressionistic and friendly and warm, and we start to infuse a bunch of stuff in there that doesn't have anything to do with it. So if you if you want, and, and then you start to become essentially, to, to, to my way of thinking, a lot of this becomes either naively or purposely unscientific, okay? And it's like, no, that's where people like John McDougall and I call people out. Like we, we may respect the, the original impressionistic research that went on into blue zones, but the truth is, as soon as you find out where that intersection is, where all those where does the diet go with the, all the blue zones? It all goes to the intersection of very similar diets in those places. Okay. Well, what's the center part of that similar diet in those places? Yeah, we know what it looks like. It, it starts looking pretty close like a McDougal diet is what it looks like. Okay. So if we start to infuse other things with this, we start to get unscientific about the process because we don't need the law of parsimony to be violated here and to start adding in things that don't make any sense. So anyway, there's there's more to the story there. Uh, it is not, yeah, uh, I, I don't mind being controversial to basically try to snap people's head back and get them focused on what the real message is. The real message is the blue zone needs to be in your kitchen. You don't need to move anywhere. Well, the thing is, I mentioned I was recently at the Plantrician Conference, and most of the doctors seem to believe this. and. The part that bothers me so much as a, as a person that cannot eat any legumes or nuts is they're making it sound like if you don't eat those two foods, you'll drop dead because that's what they ate in the blue zones. Insane. That's totally insane. The uh, And the blue zones are are in, in absolutely no way some exalted place with some special magic. Okay. It's all about getting the animal food out of the diet and basing your diet around the wet starches. That's clearly what it is. It's getting the crap out. And anybody that wants to talk to us about getting sick people well, you, you want to talk to some, you know, uh, naturalistic, holistic doctor somewhere in the middle of Italy that, you know, is in some little sweet town where people walk around barefoot and, and squish the grapes. And this is some good, good thing. And then they, they, they drink the beautiful wine. Come on. The truth is there's not a clinic in the world that can compare to True North. And True North is about taking all the food out of there. You know, so anybody that's at a plantrician talk, conference talking about how you need to eat nuts, really? You take 106 people and I'll take 106 people. You can feed them all the nuts you want. The most organically grown fancy nuts that you got from some organic fancy place somewhere in Madagascar. You go right ahead. You feed those people that diet. I will feed them nothing but distilled water. And guess what? It's not even close. So the solution to health doesn't come from the addition of things. It comes from the subtraction. It comes from the autophagy process of keeping the body as clean of excessive debris as possible. That's what causes longevity. Okay, Longevity is caused by the minimization of unnecessary destruction. It's not caused by the addition of some fancy anything. That's gonna that's gonna do some magical process. Okay. If you need some mat, there is no magical process. It's just a matter of what whether you eat and what you breathe uh, has a or what you touch and you wash your soap with, you know, what etc. It has to do with is your life process as easy on the detoxification systems as possible. That is the answer. And so, of course, there are places in the world that where that, that where the configuration of the local economy and, and the and the, uh, the behavior of the creatures that live there happens to be at a lower level of toxicity than it is at other places. Okay, that's all. And there's something else that nobody wants to mention: variation in genetics. Okay. The truth of the matter is, is that different peoples with different genetic strains have different likelihood of high longevity. That's because 
different peoples with different genetic strains, whether individually within a population, a breeding population, or whether or not it's between breeding populations in, in any species. So we, we could be talking about horses, we could be talking about dogs, and we could talk about, about peoples. And the truth of the matter is those are legitimate individual variations that are observable, and nobody wants to talk about that. Okay, that's the thing that I was trying to avoid talking about. I mean, you want to edit this out. But the bottom line is nobody wants to stare at all of these kinds of issues in the face. The truth of the matter is if you live to 100, you live to 100 not because that you, you know, lived in a small town somewhere in Okinawa and everybody was best friends and you had love in your in your heart. No, it has to do with that you had it. You were a rare outlying individual. One in a hundred to one in two hundred genetically, and nothing that you did in this life overly burdened the detoxification system. That is the only reason. Okay, so anybody else that's hypothesizing any other reason? Oh, they ate a lot of beans. You know, it's all it's beans now. Beans are the new nuts. It's not nonsense. It's complete total nonsense, and I could destroy anybody's argument in 15 minutes of scientific research. I've already done it, okay? There's no question that I'm right about this. So this is, so when you start doing this kind of research, you you you, you do this kind of correlational multicultural resource, research, and then you wind up making inferences that make no sense at all. So that's that. It's the correlation coefficient that is obvious is the two things, get rid of the smoking, get rid of the animal food, and get rid of the highly processed food, okay? Really, in that order, smoking, animal food, highly processed food, that's it. The last thing that is anywhere on the chart and cannot be found scientifically is the difference between beans and potatoes. That does not exist. That scientific evidence does not exist because it's not true. All right, there, got my, I, I vented my spleen. <laughs> but how do you really feel? Well, thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Lyle. You know, I mean, you know, um, a lot of the things you say challenge people and sometimes they get upset. You know, John McDougall's been upsetting everybody for 50 years. Thank goodness. <laughs> he okay. does it, he does it so well. <laughs> Yet he just received the Luminary Award. So he must yeah, be I mean, something. You know, Dean Ornish upset people. You know, Dean Ornish was considered a big quack. So, you know, if you're if you're going to challenge conventional thinking, it's going to rattle a bunch of people. And, you know, we don't necessarily mean to rattle a bunch of people. But the truth is, is that uh, some of this, you know, many people actually have a have an ang anxious tension about having things that are untrue perpetrated throughout the village. We know that when things are wrong, they are costly. Okay, we want to be accurate. And sometimes we also know that sometimes inaccuracy is motivated. Okay, because sometimes there's profit in perpetrating uh, inaccuracy. So that's when you start to get my, I'll start to get a little bit hostile. Okay, when I start to feel like, hmm, I'm not so sure that what you're saying, you're saying out of ignorance, I'm thinking maybe there's a motivation behind it. So I don't know that that's true. I uh, I think that sometimes many of and many of the people in our arena are they're right about 98 percent of everything that they say. So, you know, I, I give them a pass most of the time on things where I disagree with them. The um, I'm not so friendly about people out in the outside world that are that I feel like there's overwhelming evidence that, you know, if I was a cardiologist in 1995 and my colleagues weren't getting on board, I'd be screaming them in the hallway. Like, what the hell are you doing? Like, you, know, how can you not see this? So, and that's how John McDougall's lived his career. He's lived his career in constant frustration with his colleagues. And now I'm sure there's some measure of peace that he now has that, you know, he's not the only standard bearer out there yelling, that now there are thousands of physicians that now understand as a result of people, him, him and a few other people have made the case in the last half a century to move, you know, educated humanity forward, huge. Well, 
you know, uh, I, I'm just following, you know, not, not in those exalted footsteps, but whenever I see anything that smells like BS and anybody asks me, I don't make a career out of it, but anybody asks me, I'm going to tell them. Yeah. Well, it's like the, the whole trauma thing. And then they, and then they get mad at me for having you and they unsubscribe, but you know, I, I believe people should be able to speak their truth. And I'm not saying I disagree with you, but whether they, sure. Whether I agree with them or not, because as an interviewer, that's my job, not to just have everybody on the show who I agree with 100%. That's good. Well, when the trauma question is, uh, if, if people are interested, when uh, Jen Hawk and I complete our book, we will have dissected that problem in excruciating logical and empirical detail. So you will not be hearing me firing from the hip. You will be the equivalent of you reading the China study where you actually get a, a bookend to bookend explanation and detailed set of, of organization an organized argument. So I can't do justice to that argument in eight minutes of, of a question, but I can do justice in 500 pages and I will. Well, I can't wait for the book and I sure hope that you'll consider doing an audible version. We'll see about that. Okay, thanks. Do you, have time right. for, do you have time for one more question? I do. Okay, so um, we've had a similar question. This is from Audrey from Nurses, but Audrey's a nanny. And she says, how do I have willpower when I'm surrounded by junk food 10 hours a day as my job as a nanny? I pack my own food, but it's so hard. Yeah, well, the reason is that um, you weren't designed by nature for that problem. Okay, so this is very, very, very simple. Your, your adapted mind is designed to run a cost-benefit analysis uh, on, on essentially trying to acquire res valuable resources as easily as possible. So that means that eating a chocolate-covered cherry is a smarter move than eating the cherry, okay? Chocolate-covered cherry is 2,500 calories a pound. The cherry is 300 calories a pound. So it's just more valuable. And so your, your feedback systems are designed by nature to cue you to that. And so you are, uh, so you, you, uh, so after you've done that, you know, a chocolate covered cherry doesn't look like anything, but it smells like something. So if you get it close enough to you, and then of course, once you've had one, you know exactly what it is. So you're designed by nature to remember what high valuable resources look like. Okay. So why is it so difficult? Because that's your design. So the, the first step in, in unpacking this mystery is to understand that you're, you are doing precisely as you were designed by nature to do. So people are thinking there's something wrong with them, but they've got some limited amount of willpower. No, the willpower is do whatever the hell it takes to get the high valuable resource for God's sakes. That's the willpower. In other words, you're supposed to be going through you know, essentially have a lot of will and determination to get to that high valuable resource. If it's on the very top shelf of the pantry and you got to go get a ladder to get it, for God's sakes, get it. Okay. Don't eat the don't eat the stuff on the bottom shelf that's only a hundred calories a pound. Eat the stuff on the top shelf that's two thousand calories a pound. So the answer to it is that you are attempting to do something that you were not designed to do, to go exactly 180 degrees backwards when everything in you is telling you to walk forwards. So what are you gonna do? Well, you pack the food, got it, good try, okay? The, um, you, can, you can now, I would say, the, the, the next move on the equation would be pack junkier food that is a closer approximation of the junk food and not as pristine as the food that you may be packing. In other words, we're gonna try to crowd out the, the uh, if we can pack, thousand calorie a pound healthy food as opposed to that has a chance to compete with the 2000 calorie a pound junk food that's around you but the 300 calorie a pound healthy food doesn't have a chance obviously we're seeing that you are losing that battle so that would be the, the next move on the chessboard would be uh not that i have any love for bill gates who i have found out in the last four years is a is a dragon that I had no idea that he was, okay? I always had respected his intelligence and his achievements. I still know that the guy is very smart. I just don't like him. Uh, I used to, okay? So had you said, Doug, what do you think of Bill, Bill Gates? And any time in my adult history, I would have said, man, oh, that guy, I think he's probably something unbelievably special. 
Now I don't think so. Okay. But Bill Gates is a very, very smart man. And one of the things he said about uh, decision-making behavior change, you know, it stuck with me a long time since I heard it. He said, evolution, not revolution. Okay. In other words, it, the true north, i.e., I'm, I'm coming in there, falling down drunk, getting rid of my cigarettes, eating crap with both hands, and then I'm going to go to true north and fast and clean up. Good luck. We just asked for a revolution. <laughs> it's probably not going to happen. Okay. So, evolution uh, will work. You come into true north as somebody who's committed to healthy living, who has really tried, but you've stumbled and your taste buds are adulterated. And now you do a water fast and now you break the fast and now you eat the really healthy food. And now you watch Chef AJ's stuff on, on the screen and you watch Ramsey's in the kitchen and you learn some stuff. Ah, now we're evolving you. Okay. We, have, we haven't caused a revolution. We've caused an evolution. We've made an intermediary step towards the right direction. That's what I would uh, would tell you to do with this problem. You have attempted to essentially have a revolution in your motivational system to stand up to the pleasure trap. And the answer is, up. Ah, looks like you can't do it. Fair enough. So instead of a revolution, we go for evolution. So head for the middle ground and see if you have some more success. See, I would have just told her to get a different job. Not, yeah, uh, trust me, if that was an option, I mean, that's obviously the first thing that we do. But if we look at our principle, AJ, which is to work harder on your environment than you do on yourself, then the we know what the person is seeking with this question because it's an honest and decent question of a puzzled human. What's wrong with me? How can I do this? Answer, how, what magic can you do inside my nervous system that will make me make better decisions? And the answer is, oh, I can't do that because we cannot work. We're not going to work on your mind. All we can do is work on your environment because your mind is your mind. Okay. So then AJ says, get the hell out of the environment. Obviously the best solution. Okay. But we also already can infer that people's lives aren't that flexible and they don't necessarily have those options. So what can we do next to do the environment? Well, what you've attempted to do isn't succeeding because you've given yourself too difficult of an environmental challenge. So what can we do? We can try to make it easier. So we can make your health food more indulgent. Let's try to do that and see whether or not we can get there. Well, you know, I used, to, I used to be a pastry chef and I don't think I would have gotten slim and maintained it if I still had to have that job. Oh, I don't think so. No, you know? uh, I'm sure that I'm sure that that's true. So I mean, the uh, so we we don't this but this is the this is the best approximation of a strategy that could help. Uh, and so we would try this strategy and see whether or not we can get a toehold. That's what we would do. You know, before I met you in 2011, I had a consultation with a person. I'm not going to mention them because they're not they don't. They don't do plant-based, but she is considered an expert in food addiction. And she said, you're going to have to quit your job if you want to recover. As luck would have it, the restaurant was sold and I didn't have to make that decision. But that's the advice I was given. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was straight talk from your therapist. Really. Yeah. Good. Yeah. I was I was going to let you go. But this question is about circumcision and I just have to know your answer. OK. Oh, it's, no. Okay. We don't right. get a lot of, I think this is our first circumcision question from Heidi. Okay. I have a 17 year old son that has asked me to get him circumcised. I don't agree with circumcision and told him so and that he can do it when he's older on its own in the hope it will change his mind. How do you think I should handle it? I'm told by somebody I used to work with that as an adult, it's very, very painful. I mean, I'm sure it's painful as a child and the way they do it in Judaism, it's like it, I, I can't even go to, they're called brisses anymore. They're so horrific, but um, I'm curious what you're going to say. Um, yeah, I, I think that, uh, that this falls under under the heading of never make a big decision when a small decision will do. And a, a life altering decision, you know, I mean, a very significant surgical decision at a 17 year old uh, seems to me to be a young a very early juncture to be attempting to do that analysis and make a decision that we're going to have uh, long-term inner peace with. Now, uh, that being said, uh, I, I, my attitude would be, hey, it's up to you, but I'm not going to aid and abet this and I'm not going to pay for it. So if you want to you know, get a job, you know, 
and, uh, and go down and save up all of your coinage and, and go spend it on that, fine. You know, I mean, I, I can't possibly stop you. You're a free human. The, um, so that, that would be my attitude about that. In other words, if it's, uh, I sure as heck wouldn't gift it to him for his 18th birthday. There's no way uh, I would, because my attitude would be, if it's such a great idea, it'll be a great idea when you're 25. So the, this is, you know, whenever I'm, re, you know, going to gonna tee off on something and get out of line in the world, I tell myself, Doug, you know, if it's such a great idea, it'll be a great idea 30 days from now. Just freaking cool down. <laughs> Try to cool down a little bit. So uh, if if things are a great idea, then they will be a great idea later. There's no reason to rush something like that. And there are, are certain decisions in this world that are you know, irrevocable. We, we, we can't reverse them. And so, so specifically with irrevocable decisions, it is a very good idea to delay and delay and delay and delay until the evidence overwhelms us over a long period of time where we just say, hey, you know what? That's, that's the right decision. I, I keep running the cost benefit. I keep gathering more data. I keep letting life go by and it keeps telling me that's the right decision. You know, I should move to Florida for God's sakes. I've, I've had enough in Minnesota. It's like, if it just keeps coming over and keeps coming over and keeps coming over and keeps coming over, you know, then fine, then make that decision. But I mean, even that's not an irrevocable decision, but the, uh, the point is this one's a big one. And, uh, you know, I don't think it's a tragedy no matter what the young man does, but it's not likely to be in case they slip and make a mistake, at which point now we do have a tragedy. And that's happened more than once. So the um, so at any rate, the that that's how I think about it. So my attitude would be listen, I, I would tell any kid, don't make a big decision when a small decision will do. If if this is a, a great idea, it'll be a great idea two years from now. You know, I wouldn't tell the kid 25 because that kid. You know, 25 years old is so far out there over the horizon that that, that seems like it's going to be the end of the Ming dynasty, for God's sakes. So instead, we say, listen, you know, if, if it's such a good idea, it'll be a good idea when you turn 20. OK, whatever. And we delay them without it. We're like, no, I'm going to do this. It's like, fine. Go to Taco Bell, save your coinage. You know what I mean? Fair enough. If you if you you want to pay for it, but I'm not lifting a nickel. Towards that, towards that, because you know, I think it's a decision that needs to wait and be have a much greater scrutiny and thought associated with it. That's how it, I would look at that. It's it, this. I guess if you're going to have it done, it's better to have it done when you're first born. Or, you know, I I actually don't even know. You know, the, the CVs on this. Uh, I haven't actually looked at the cost benefits on all sides of this. I I can remember. I can remember reading something that. That I then I read contrary evidence later. So in the last five or ten years, I actually looked at some uh, evidence on this for some strange reason. But twenty five years ago, I looked at some evidence on this uh, for some strange reason. God knows why. And um, and I remember reading in some report that the wives of men that were circumcised had you know, one third the likelihood of uterine cancer or some such thing. In other words, there was actually a medical benefit to the wives, not the husbands, um, uh, uh, for, for circumcised. But the problem with that is that th there was many problems with that research. And th that is not necessarily, it's not a random assignment con the condition. So the people that might have been circumcised aren't necessarily an equal population. It's not apples to apples, okay? And so that's a problem. So I, and I, it seems to me that I looked at some similar research in the last five or 10 years, and the effect that I had remembered from that research uh, 25 years ago or 30 years ago was gone. In other words, I believe I remember being surprised looking for that same effect and finding that it had disappeared in some updated research. So I don't know that there is any uh, medical advantage to this in a way that might have been true in the past and is no longer true. 
um, or was misunderstood in the past because they did not understand the importance of random assignment with respect to, to, uh, to such a decision. So in other words, you have to have pretty good comparison groups, socioeconomic status, medical treatment status, all kinds of other things. You, you would have to be pretty, if you're not going to get a random assignment condition, but you could certainly do a much better job of match controls uh, and make damn sure there isn't substantial differences between what it is that you're looking at. So this is a, it's an interesting question, but I can damn well tell you almost for sure that there's no medical advantage to the individual themselves. Okay, so there's no medical advantage to getting cut, not getting cut, for God's sakes, as far as that goes. So what is the value? Aesthetic, sexual attractiveness, partners are going to think it's better or not. Like, that's what somebody might be thinking. All legitimate things to be considered by, by the young man. But if it's such a great idea, maybe it's a great idea later. Let the evidence seep in and, and let's not be in a rush. I'll never forget one, one time I saw Robin Williams in uh, doing live comedy. He said, an uncircumcised penis is like a worm in a sweater. And I never forgot that visual. <laughs> what a great way to end. So Dr. Lyle, thank you so much. All right. Very good. And uh, thanks for having me, AJ. And uh, I'll see you soon. Right. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time for Kathy Hester. I'm sure she'll be giving us an update on how her and Cheryl are doing on the McDougal program. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.